Welcome back to Obsession TV. I'm Gemma Houghton. Today, my guest is Seth Elliott, who is the Chief Marketing and Commercial Officer at Bloombees, a platform which enables merchants across the world to sell and grow their customer base. Today, we're going to be talking about the changing trends in e-commerce and how businesses can find new ways to get customers online. Hi, Seth. Thanks Hi. for being here. My pleasure. So, firstly, the whole world is changing in digital, the whole way that people do business, the whole way that people buy online is changing. What are the key trends that you're seeing now that you think are really interesting for people to be aware of? Well, I think you, you, you referenced it, but one of the biggest changes is outside of mature markets, we're seeing literally thousands upon millions of individuals start these small businesses and whereas 10 years ago or even five years ago, uh, they would be starting some form of small business and selling in their local markets. Now they start creating products. And the first thing almost that they do is go to social media, yeah. uh, particularly like Instagram, and start promoting their products uh, to followers in an attempt to sell to them. Uh, so it's really interesting. The, the World Bank actually says that there are uh, somewhere around 450 million micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises in emerging markets. Almost half a billion. Now, a large proportion of those are like service enterprises, yeah. but even so, probably 30% of those sell products. So you're talking about somewhere so around 140 to 150 million little businesses growing probably at like 12 to 15% every year. So that kind of, that's really saying that anybody, anywhere can start a business and they can start selling almost globally so easily you know they do not need a big huge team of people they don't need a marketing team they can just do it themselves well almost and that's what's really interesting right so several years ago there wasn't really the opportunity for people around the world to do what we just said mm. certainly that existed in the united states in other mature markets uh, and over time there have been solutions that are, enable you as a small seller uh, to have an e-commerce platform so today the first part of what we talked about is true which is emerging market merchants or merchants in secondary markets yeah. from a from a maturity standpoint uh, can use social media which is borderless it's digital yeah. and social media is completely global in nature they can use those uh, channels to promote, but then they have to actually transact. Yeah. And transacting becomes a little bit of a challenge. So many of these merchants, these, these small, we don't even want to call them small businesses because a lot of times they're just an individual. Yeah. They haven't formed any sort of corporate entity. Many of these people, what they do is they start promoting on social media and then they say, okay, so now what do I do to sell? So they literally will do things like in their Instagram profile, put their WhatsApp phone number. And then they have these hundreds, perhaps, of WhatsApp conversations yeah. with various people. And then they have to accept some form of payment. So it, it goes down to the level of, of accepting, you know, sometimes PayPal. Uh, many times it might be something like Western Union. And I, I kid you not, hundreds of thousands of times it's a bank transfer. So mm -hmm. a seller has to give a buyer their bank transfer. Yeah. And then a buyer has to decide that they're going to send money without any credit card behind them to some seller that they don't know that they found on social media. And not to mention that is a bit of a laborious process, isn't it? When we're so used to being able to just click a button and, you know, pay by yeah, account. Yeah, highly laborious. You don't have to then go and log on to your bank and make that, yeah. type in the details and get a code. I mean, it is quite complicated. And then as the seller, you have to manage all of that process yeah. and you have to match up who it was that I actually got the payment from mm -hmm. and send it to the, the product to them. So it is highly time intensive, highly laborious. And, and not scalable. And it's not scalable and it's also a, uh, basically a barrier to selling globally. So so even though social has really enabled the opportunities uh, for people in the emerging markets particularly, uh, there's still this little bit of a disconnect and it's the promise of e-commerce, the democratized promise of e-commerce. Yeah. And, okay. and so uh, it hasn't arrived so easily and Bloombees actually solves that problem. That's what we happen to do is mm. we happen to offer merchants in these kinds of countries the ability to transact. We have buyer and seller protection. There's over 20 forms of payment that we allow people to accept inside our platform. Uh, and we also actually help them by giving them the ability to utilize a shipping and fulfillment function inside the platform. And that's what really starts to lead people towards e-commerce growth and scalability. And that's something that is also a key point because it's not just about how you can send a payment because you have bank transfers of paying, but it's easy to do. But it's actually, yeah, how on earth do you then ship to people right. in every country? And that's the kind of danger, I guess, with starting out on social media, which, as you say, is totally borderless. Anybody anywhere can see you. And if you get a bit of traction and you get somebody who 
you know, has a few followers that likes your post, that shares your bag, that shares what, you know, whatever it is you're making, then you could suddenly be inundated with people all around the world and not have the ability to. That's right. If you were, for example, an artisan in Argentina yeah. and you have a set of, let's say, 1,500 only Instagram followers, it might be that several of them are international. Mm. Maybe some of them have followers that have large yeah. followers themselves. And all of a sudden, you virally had a post of yours shared around the world and you suddenly might start getting orders from Japan. Uh, or Russia, what do you do then? Uh, yeah. It's hard enough for you transacting inside of Argentina or the rest of Central or South America. What happens now when you have to deal with uh, with transacting and shipping all the way across the world? And many times merchants just say, I won't do it because it's too complicated for them. And that's, a, that's again, a point of friction that exists in the economy that basically prevents people from taking advantage of e-commerce and the, and the lack of, of global barriers. And then what does this mean, this kind of shift, do you think, mean for bigger, you know, bigger e-commerce players and not necessarily, you know, Amazon and other huge companies like that, but, you know, the bigger, more established, you know, brands as opposed to these local players, you know, are we likely to see a change where these, it's not so important to be a big brand in e-commerce and that actually they're going to find the competition doesn't come from Amazon necessarily, but comes from these smaller players that... I've now got bigger access to the work. Yeah, it's, a, it's an open question, right? It's an interesting one. I think that uh, you rightly demarcate between e-commerce uh, retailers like Amazon or Zalando or Dewanda or mm. some of these other uh, types of, of marketplaces. And then let's call them brands or traditional retailers, yeah. right? And what we may start to see is something similar to like what happened in Hollywood. So it used to be that studios produced cool films and distributed films. And over time, the risk of producing those yeah. films started to be shifted down towards independent producers yeah. and the studios basically became a distribution mechanism. Yeah. So a lot of these enterprise sellers may become more of a distribution mechanism and a feeder for some of the emerging brands that start to grow up under e-commerce. But even so, scaling is hard. And even for large brands, scaling is hard. Trying to activate the promise of social media followers, uh, we're still in the infancy of that. So people use influencers and yeah. they use social media. Uh, but there hasn't necessarily been the next generation yet of, of activating social media. Mm -hmm. It's something that Bloomies also happens to do. We happen yeah. to offer a piece of the platform for both small and large merchants that allows them to activate their social followers uh, as effectively a virtual marketing force and pay them as a result if they deliver sales. But that's just probably one of a number of models that will emerge as social media continues to yeah. grow and mature uh, and, and more of the world becomes uh, actively integrated in regards to emerging brands and sales. And that's also the challenge because, again, scaling in terms of shipping, but scaling in terms of managing an online profile when it starts to increase, when you start to get a lot of messages, when you start to be in different markets with maybe people starting to say, well, can I talk to you about this in Spanish or in mm. Japanese or in Malaysian, Chinese, whatever language it is might be that they speak. And there needs to be, for this to be actually something that can grow and a new trend that can come out and for people to literally be able to buy from anywhere around the world, those kind of things need to be taken into account somehow. Yes, and a lot of times the way we, we in general would call that is localization issues, yeah. right? And uh, we happen to address that as well. There are a number of issues that we, we actively address. There are some that we're looking to address. Other people are doing the same thing in some regards. In our case, uh, we create a localization language-wise um, for wherever it is that you as the buyer come from. Mm -hmm. uh, that also includes currency localization. Those yeah. are challenges that occur, um, and, and shipping itself becomes some, sometimes challenging mm -hmm. in that regard. Uh, but one of the other pieces that's inherent in what you just said is how do the buyer and seller communicate with one another. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy right now when someone, again, we'll use my example from Argentina, if someone from Argentina speaks more than Spanish, yeah. right, then they can use more than one language in their WhatsApp communications. Uh, but they probably don't also speak Japanese and Russian. Yeah. So now yeah. what happens? Well, hopefully the buyer in Japan or Russia speaks either Spanish or English or whatever other yeah. language the Argentine seller speaks. But oftentimes that's not going to happen. No. So again, you result in lost sales. We yeah. actually solve that problem by having a live chat function that actually translates on the fly between mm -hmm. buyer and seller. Um, but that's an important issue for the world at large, including large brands. There's not really... A a way to statically localize. You can statically localize your product 
catalog. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're Zara, since we're here in Madrid, and you're trying to sell in Russia or Japan on a digital basis, uh, you're going to need to provide some level of support to those countries. Yeah. So that has costs associated with it. And so somewhere you need to find a mechanism to reduce those costs and create efficiencies by engaging in some form of localization. We do it in a number of ways, including live chat inside the app, but other people are going to are, are gonna have to attack it in other ways. Yeah. Can, yeah, do that. And another kind of question or, or issue maybe that this raises for bigger brands and for kind of more established players with you know, big teams behind them is that if this trend is more for people being able to, you know, interact with the person that makes the, the goods, it's about, you know, building a connection. I've got this amazing piece of art or whatever it might be from a person who created it in the deepest, darkest corners of the world. Do brands need to change their approach that the way they sell? Because by just having a, you know, big shop full of load of clothes that are pretty generic and there's no story behind them, there's no connection to the person that's made them. Is that something that brands need to work on in order to kind of not lose out in the future? I mean, I think it will depend on the brand and your customers, but I think what you're identifying is probably even on a broader sense, the fact that more and more purchasers are interested less in products and features and more in experiences and emotions. Yeah. So one of the ways that we see that manifest itself is across everything from food to apparel to artisan handmade goods yeah. is a desire to connect with the individuals yeah. that actually produce the goods. Mm -hmm. um, we happen to enable that a little bit more because we've created a platform that allows artisans in, in these emerging market countries yeah. to sell. So just by virtue of that, we tend to, to be operating in that mix. Yeah. Um, but I think that larger brands are probably going to start doing uh, either collaborations or curations. Yeah. Um, or again, we go back to the analogy we just talked about, the studio model, where mm -hmm. a larger brand may also serve more to use their own distribution mechanism to partner with some of yeah, these emerging to push, brands. To and bring some of these people through exactly. and kind of hold them up as part of the brand. Exactly, yeah. or create kind of what amounts to capsule collections, even though yeah. they're not, by some you know artisan yeah. that creates. So these, this beautiful piece of art from uh, you know uh, Nigeria. Uh, well, maybe that actually gets fed through one, uh, an enterprise level brand as a piece of a capsule or limited edition collection yeah. uh, in order to take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah. And some of the other e-commerce style sites that exist that were either flash sale or discovery oriented um, do that as well. Places like uh, aha.com try and find and curate interesting, more connected art seasonal yeah. style merchants that they then provide to their uh, to their audience on a kind of yeah. almost like a flash sale basis. Yeah. I think we'll see more of that and we may see more of that from larger brands. Certainly yeah. larger brands aren't going to continue to ignore this desire to connect yeah, and so they'll absolutely. find various ways to try and take advantage of it. And then one other thing relating to you know the fact you, you're talking a lot about the emerging markets and that's where a lot of these merchants come. Which countries in particular or which regions are you seeing, you know, are there any trends as to which regions are really kind of harnessing this and are really, you know, seeing a lot of activity in this area? It's almost every region that you would think of that's not a mature market in nature. Yeah. We see uh, stuff coming out of uh, Russia and the former CIS states, mm -hmm. um, which is arguably not even an emerging market, but certainly not what you would call necessarily yeah, digitally not, mature. Yeah. Uh, we see a huge amount coming out of uh, South America and, and Mexico and, mm -hmm. and that entire region. Um, there's certainly a large, large um, push uh, out of India if you go search on Instagram for Shop Worldwide, you'll see so many uh, small brands that are selling out of uh, out of India in this regard, uh, and Southeast Asia is a yeah. is a certainly a big area for this as well, um, uh, particularly places like Thailand and Indonesia. So uh, almost anywhere you can imagine yeah. that isn't a what we think of all as perhaps as a digitally mature market, yeah. uh, we're starting to see substantive growth, and it's not surprising because the tools now, as we as we just discussed are there to enable people from these markets to activate and sell to a larger audience base. Uh, Instagram added 100 million users in the last four months. So the yeah. <laughs> rate of growth in regards to connectivity 
is huge. And that connectivity is what allows merchants to sell. And it makes a big difference when you are in a market in which your average monthly income is particularly small. Any one sale that you make outside of your core region yeah. could have a very substantive effect on your income. And that's something that at Bloomby's, even though obviously we're a for-profit business, that's something that we're, that we're very excited mm. about. Anytime we can enable uh, a merchant, yeah. and it particularly has an effect on, on their economic economic circumstances that's really yeah. quite exciting absolutely and of course you know as that starts to build if like you say they don't necessarily have to sell a huge amount in order to think right we can do more of this and that then enables them to scale a bit more and grow bigger and that you know opens right. up so many opportunities for them but for consumers around the world that's absolutely right yeah yeah, so yeah. connecting these types of merchants to consumers and markets that are starting more and more to care about them is really interesting the artisan market as a whole across mm -hmm. the world is estimated to be today about 35 billion dollars annually and that includes artisans in in mature markets yeah. as well right so that probably means that there's somewhere between three and ten times that amount that actually could be transacted yeah. if those artisans were able to more readily reach customers that would be interested yeah. in them. And as you pointed out, we know that more and more there are customers that would be interested in them. Yeah. It's just a matter of them being able Making to access them. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as, they, yeah, as these kind of trends increase, as the, the, the tools and the, the, the opportunities increase, then yeah, the whole, shit, the, the whole world of e-commerce is going to shift quite Yeah, no quite question. Huge. Yeah, no yeah. question. Quite exciting times then. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for talking about it today. Pleasure. It was great Thanks. to hear all about it. Thanks for having me here.